The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 1279 in the name of Neil Finlay on retained tax jobs in Bathgate. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Neil Finlay to open the debate. Mr Finlay, seven minutes, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer, and thanks to the members who have signed my motion. Can I declare an interest, as I am the current chair of the PCS parliamentary group, PCS being the trade union that represents uh, Her Majesty's Revenue, Revenue and Customs staff. Uh, the motion, uh, as is the nature of members' business, reflects local issues in my region, but I want to make this short debate about issues much wider than that, because the UK government's policy of tax office closures will, and indeed already is, impacting upon communities and workers across the UK. Jobs will go in Aberdeen, Cumbernauld, Dundee, East Kilbride, Glasgow, Inverness, Irvine and Glenrothes, but also in Bradford, Middlesbrough, Colchester, Brighton, Derby, Newry, Taunton, Wrexham and Wolverhampton, and a whole host of other places in between, and some redundancies have already occurred. And I want to express my solidarity with these communities and the worker, workers affected, because their struggle just now is our struggle too. Uh, on the 12th of November 2015, HMRC published its plans for the future of HMRC. It was a complete misnomer entitled Building the Future. That plan seeks to close over 160 tax offices across the UK with a move to just 13 or so regional hubs specialising in four areas of work. President officer, you don't build the future by taking a wrecking ball to one of our most important and key public services, the administration and collection of taxes. The very taxes that pay for our NHS, that pay for the education system and for our emergency services and all the rest of the services that civilise our society. In my own region, there are planned closures at Livingston, at Barbara Ritchie House, at the Pyramids Bathgate and in Edinburgh, at Elgin House, Greyfield House and Meldrum House. Around 2,000 or so jobs to be centralised to an unidentified location in Edinburgh. This will have a devastating impact on the areas affected and in particular in West Lothian. Because, President Officer, in 1985, as far back as that, unemployment in that area after the closure of British Leyland and Pokemet Pit was sky high, sitting at up to 26% in some areas. The development of Silicon Glen and production facilities like NEC, Bird Brown, Seagate and others provided jobs and hope for many. And just a stone throw from the giant BL site, Motorola came in with 3,000 people producing mobile phones, my brother, one of them. But it closed in 2001 and the tax credit centre then took over the building. But now these jobs are under threat too. And for some people, this could be the third redundancy in that location. Now, the issues I'm going to raise in relation to West Lothian can no doubt be applied to many of the other places that will be affected by this plan, because this will be at huge cost to the local economy. Around 1,000 jobs will be taken out of West Lothian and centralised. It's estimated that each worker spends £1,000 per year in the local economy, in shops and petrol stations, uh, snack bars, etc. But over 5 million, uh, cumulatively, will be taken out of the economy. Uh, the staff affected will be expected to travel much further, up to an hour to an hour and a half each way. And this is what is deemed reasonable by HMRC. 40% of these staff have caring responsibilities for children, elderly relatives, or family members with a disability. For, for many of them, moving to a big city location is simply not an option. Any closure would, in many cases, cost them their job. We, we must be clear about that. A number of staff have themselves a disability or have raised issues relating to a disability, making a move to Edinburgh extremely difficult for them. And with the shambles that is currently ScotRail, is it any wonder that they're worried about their future? And the cost of travel is another area of concern. A simple calculation, if we look at Going by public transport from train from Bathgate to Edinburgh is £9.10 per day, a bit less from Livingston. From workers who currently work at that location who live in North Lanarkshire, Fife, 
Falkirk and Glasgow, the costs will be much higher, maybe slightly less if you go by car. And this will fall upon workers whose average earnings is 21,000 a year, some of them significantly below that. The additional travel costs would be a very significant hit on their pay. And this imposed on a group of staff who have been, been subjected to pay cuts, pensions cuts, and a general all-out attack on their terms and conditions. PCS branches up and down the country have been working with local authorities, local businesses and trades councils to campaign against these closures. They're demanding local equalities impact assessments are carried out. But I think we should go further. We need social, economic and environmental impact assessments of these plans too. And I think such assessments would expose the policy as unworkable, damaging and a costly mess. Government jobs should not be centralised. They should be decentralised to provide jobs, opportunities and spread the economic gain across the country. Scotland is gaining many more tax and benefit powers. We need skilled staff with the knowledge of systems and processes who hold information, uh, who, who know about the information and know how to administer those taxes and benefits. And at the time of things like the Panama Papers, tax avoidance on an industrial scale of change, and changes to the benefits system, this call of HMRC could not be more badly timed. If we roll all of these issues into one, then we have one almighty dog's breakfast, and it is the UK Tory government who is taking us into that. President officer, I hope that Parliament, all parliamentarians, no matter their party allegiance, see this for what it is, a policy that is bad for workers, bad for communities, and bad for the economy. The UK government should scrap these ridiculous plans now. Thank you very much, Mr Finlay. I call Marie Todd, be followed by Miles Briggs. Ms Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to Neil Finlay for raising this in Parliament this evening. He, along with many other local elected representatives, is clearly concerned about the effect the job cuts will have on HMRC workers currently employed in Bathgate and on Bathgate as a community. I share his concern, but unfortunately the motion barely scratches the surface of this issue. Bathgate, as you said, is just one of the 17 HMRC offices across Scotland set to close thanks to the so-called consolidation of this network of offices. HMRC are set to cut over 2,000 of their staff here in Scotland from those 17 offices which are currently situated in communities all over Scotland and which currently provide vital skilled jobs to areas that depend on them. It's a move that will be deeply damaging to those communities, from Dundee to Cumbernauld, Bathgate and to Inverness in my constituency. It's local communities up and down Scotland that are set to lose out on jobs which their local economies rely on. It's a decision that Scotland had no say over, a decision made hundreds of miles away in London and one that will have serious impact on the lives of those families and communities that will be affected here in Scotland. To make matters worse, this is just the latest in a string of broken vows from the independence referendum made hand in hand by Conservatives, Lib Dems and Labour alike. These same communities that were told just two years ago that the only way to protect HMRC jobs in Scotland was to vote against independence are now facing up to the reality of losing over 2,000 of those jobs. A Scottish Labour tweet from their anti-independence campaign read, 1,400 jobs at HMRC in Cumbernauld are dependent on us staying in the UK. Well, we stayed in the UK. So why is it that HMRC offices in Cumbernauld are set to close by 2020? And of course, it isn't just the community in Cumbernauld who have been deceived by the Labour campaigners. Inverness is set to be one of the first offices to close under these cuts. Yes. Um, Mr Finlay. Surely, surely workers out there deserve more 
than the rerun of the independence campaign. And we need positive action from people across the parliament to try and retain people's jobs. It might soothe the member's conscience to say this, but let's get on with trying to protect jobs and let's not start rerunning old debates. Ms Todd. I would ask Mr Finlay to have a think about his own conscience and his own role in the promises that were made, the false promises that were made to the people of Scotland during that independence referendum debate. The Inverness office is set to close by 2018 with 50 jobs at stake to the detriment of the local economy and the families who now face uncertain futures due to these job losses. This is not the first of promises made to Scotland that's been broken and I fear it won't be the last. But of course, we in this parliament are led to understand that these 2,000 job losses are absolutely necessary. Providing jobs in Scotland is simply too expensive. That's why HMRC have decided to open a tax super centre which will provide 2,800 new jobs to people in Croydon. So HMRC can provide extra jobs in the southeast of England, but Scotland has to accept job losses. This is reflective of a wider attitude towards Scotland from powers in London. In the words of Boris Johnson, who is now a UK government minister, his exact words, my argument to the Treasury is that a pound spent in Croydon is of far more value to the country from a straight utilitarian calculus than a pound in spent in Strathclyde. I would ask my Conservative members in this debate to reflect on that. I hope all members of all parties will join me in calling on HMRC and the UK government to protect Scottish jobs and to stop the consolidation of tax offices which will damage communities all over Scotland. Thank you. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by um, commending Neil Finlay for uh, bringing this debate to Parliament this evening. I'd also like to put on record the, the, the legitimate concerns that exist over the proposed changes. And I've met with representatives of the Pyramids Business Park, along with West Lothian Council, MPs and MSPs from across parties. And I agreed to support the joint appeal to HMRC that called on them to look again at the real concerns and reconsider their proposals. In addition to the joint letter, I've also written twice directly to John Thompson, the Chief Executive of HMRC, and I'll be following this up with a further letter to the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, Jane Ellison, who will be the Minister responsible. HMRC says its plans are part of a wider government strategy to develop hubs in key locations that maximise flexibility and customer services. Like all public sector organisations, it's under pressure to reduce the cost to the taxpayer of providing these services. And I have to say to Mary Todd that I was disappointed by the tone of her contribution to this debate. MSPs from across the parties, including both cabinet secretaries here this evening, have been working together on this issue. And Scotland is home to 12% of the HMRC workforce. The UK government has given a commitment that these jobs will remain in Scotland. But as it proposes these changes, I believe it's crucial that HMRC fully addresses the concerns of workers currently based in West Lothian who will be affected and ensure that any changes really do offer the best possible deal to the taxpayer once all factors have actually been taken into account. As Neil Finlay has said, research undertaken by the business park owners and West Lothian Council indicate that 85% of staff actually earn less than £21,000 £21, per annum. So the key issue of additional travel costs for West Lothian-based employees to Edinburgh or Glasgow must be considered. In addition, 40% of employees have caring responsibilities which could be compromised by the extra, extra commuting time, and 20% of the workforce have a disability. This latter statistic should be welcomed and is testament to the positive working conditions to date that HMRC have actually provided. And is, yes. I Mr Finlay. I saw today that the Scottish leader of his party was the warm-up act for the Prime Minister. Uh, now that she seems to be, uh, have the Prime Minister's ear, will he urge the leader of the Scottish Tory party, to tell Mrs May to scrap these plans. Mr Briggs. Well, as I've said at the beginning of my contribution, we've, I've written to the Treasury Secretary already, Jane Ellison, who will be taking this decision and will have specifically raised these actual issues. 
and have been assured that one-to-one -one meetings will take place between staff and managers at least a year in advance of any move and caring responsibilities, travel times, costs and other personal circumstances will be discussed as well as a special daily travel allowance being made available if this decision goes forward. These additional costs, whether through train fares or additional mileage, clearly will be significant. And I'd hope that HMRC could begin assessing these now so that we actually have the facts in front of us. MSPs from across the chamber will be very much aware the proposed reforms of services in the past have been taken forward in the name of delivering better value for money to the taxpayer, when in fact, Beyond this, we see that the taxpayer um, has to spend more on these services. So I hope HMA, HMRC understand and outline these costs ahead of any relocation. I'll be asking, as I've mentioned, the Financial Secretary to urge HMRC to undertake this work so that we have these additional costs and they can be tested, tested and factored into overall decision making. Not least, as the Pyramid site will continue to offer, I believe, a very competitive rental and business rate exchange compared to any of Edinburgh's city centre locations. To conclude, presiding officer, I again welcome today's debate. It's allowed MSPs from across the chamber to voice genuine concerns. And I'd urge HMRC to fully engage with West Lothian Council, the local workforce and its representatives to demonstrate its proposals will provide value for money to the taxpayer and will not disadvantage local employees to the extent that they cannot work for HMRC in the future. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey, be followed by Linda Fabiani. Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and let me also start by congratulating Neil Finlay on securing this debate and bringing the concerns of workers employed at the HMRC office, not just in Bathgate, but indeed in many other locations to the Chamber. Um, people will cover the challenges, I'm sure, faced by the staff in, in Bathgate in a comprehensive way. I don't want to add to that. I do want to focus on the context in which we find ourselves because it's right to look back at what HMRC did when they announced their so-called consolidation plans in November 2015. What this means, as we've heard, is the closure of 17 offices across Scotland to be re replaced by two super centres in Edinburgh and Glasgow. So it doesn't solely affect Bathgate, and as we've heard from Neil Finlay, centres in Aberdeen, in Dundee, in Cumbernauld, in East Kilbride, Glasgow and Inverness will close. And I understand that Irvine and Glenrothes are already in the process of closing. Um, and it's equally right to acknowledge the closures across the UK. Now, the current level of employment across the sites in Scotland is about 8,300. Expected to be 6,300 when the programme of consolidation is completed by 2021. So consolidation is clearly the new name for cuts. Because I fail to understand how a cut of 2,000 staff can be justified, and I'll come on to explore that in a minute. But the impact to individuals with increased travel time, or at worst losing their jobs, has been outlined by others and will, I'm sure, with other speakers too. But equally so is the impact on the local economy. But it is to the question of the job losses that I want to return, because the Scottish Parliament has significant new devolved powers, nowhere more so than in taxation. We've seen responsibilities for some of those new taxes passed over two years ago with stamp duty, and then more last year with the Scottish rate of income tax, and the Scottish Government have found it challenging. I don't blame them for that. I think that is taxation. We have been good at spending the money we've been given. It is a whole other ball game when you're responsible for the other side of that equation when you're raising taxes. To lose capacity, to lose expertise at such a delicate time seems completely ridiculous and not thought through. Last year, the Scottish Government decided not to vary the Scottish rate of income tax, but the volume of work in making sure the systems worked effectively was not in any way diminished by that. Indeed, considerable effort was made to ensure that the process was as smooth as possible as we transitioned. The Parliament may decide in the future to vary the Scottish rate of income tax. If they do so, delivery of that may well be challenging and will require expertise and capacity. But equally ensuring compliance with tax collection is an issue for HMRC as a whole. Closing offices on this scale may pose a threat to the operation of HMRC and indeed last year the UK Parliament's Public Accounts Committee said that the customer service was so bad that it could be affecting tax collection. 
So you don't add to that pressure by reducing staff numbers. Presiding officer, I'm coming to a close. When, the first, when this issue was first raised, the First Minister said she would be seeking urgent talks with the UK government. I would be grateful if the Minister, in his contribution, could tell us whether these happened and what was the result. And finally, presiding officer, let me say as gently as I can to Mary Todd. There are many occasions to debate the constitutional future of the UK and Scotland. Some might argue that having a £15 billion black hole in our public finances each year would lead to many more job losses. But what I can say to her is staff in HMRC will be utterly bemused that we choose instead to scrap with each other instead of focusing on their interests. This parliament should unite in their interests. Thank you. I call Linda Fabiani to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Ms Fabiani, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I just want to make, make a small contribution because when I read Neil Finlay's motion and listened to him speak uh, tonight about the situation in Bathgate, it struck me very much that it's a very similar situation to that faced in East Kilbride. Um, in East Kilbride, of course, we have Centre One as the main centre uh, for HMRC, and Centre One... Um, Queensway House is its technical name, uh, has always been known as a centre of expertise in East Kilbride. Uh, we're now talking about 2,500 jobs moving from East Kilbride if these plans go ahead. And, and that's a huge imposition, uh, not just on the workers themselves, with all the problems that Neil Finlay raised in terms of travel costs and time, caring responsibilities. It also has a big impact on the local economy. Um, 2,500 people moving out of a town is a huge impact. And one of the things that really bothers me is that there has been no economic impact assessment carried out by the UK government. And Neil Finlay is quite right. It's about more than that. It should be a socio-economic impact study that's there. And not only that, as far as I can see and as far as I um, have learned from my colleagues uh, who are in the Westminster government, there has been no real parliamentary scrutiny about this either. And that gives me great concern. Indeed, um, when I looked back at the written questions I had asked of our own government uh, here in Scotland, there wasn't even any proper formal discussion with the government of Scotland when, when this was announced. Now, Centre One, as I said, is the main, tower, the main place, although there's also the Plaza Tower, and uh, there's another premise in Hobank Road, which has been run down as we speak. Um, but there's great expertise in Centre One. It's been built up over the years, and you know, as the PCS union say, tax, tax experts will tell you that a local tax office is actually essential to ensuring that taxpayers comply with their obligations, and that expertise should be kept and I can't for the life of me understand why we have to uproot really experienced workers from the likes of East Kilbride and Bathgate and move them elsewhere. One of the issues in, in Centre One at Queensway House is that although it's being said that um, it will be 2026 before all these jobs are moved, the lease of that premises comes up some time before that because actually Queensway House was sold off by Gordon Brown to an offshore company. So could I perhaps ask the Minister if he could find out for us, please, um, when the lease for Queensway House is actually up, because we're finding it very difficult to get that information. I'd just like to conclude by mentioning the PCS Union and their stay in East Kilbride campaign. They quite clearly weren't consulted on the plans to remove staff from East Kilbride, despite being the recognised trade union for most of the staff. I suspect that's the same in Bathgate and other locations. And the Stay in UK campaign has called on this closure to be at least paused. They'd like it stopped, of course they would. And the proposal is actually subject to full parliamentary scrutiny and public consultation. So I would like to close, presiding officer, and thank you by saying thank you to Neil Finlay for allowing us to, to talk about this today, but also to say, yes, of course, jobs, tax jobs should be retained in, Bath, in Bathgate. And of course, um, tax jobs should stay in East Kilbride. Thank you.
Thank you, Col Gordon. Lindhurst will fall by Lane Smith. Mr Lindhurst. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I start by thanking Neil Finlay for bringing this debate to Parliament. And also, may I thank my colleague, Miles Briggs, for all of his efforts in this matter. Clearly, this is an important issue within our region, which has arisen following the announcement by HMRC in November of last year that it intended to streamline its services. The intention, of course, was to meet modern trends where customers expect to be able to engage at the touch of a button. And this is within a climate of an increasing need to do more with less to enable Scotland and the UK to live within our means. As has already been pointed out, the plans are not just for Scotland, but indeed the wider UK, leading to the consolidation of, I understand, 170 offices into 13. These new offices are to be sited primarily within cities on the premise that these places offer not only the infrastructure required of regional centres, but also the technical expertise working alongside colleges and universities in bigger cities. The requirement to streamline an update is often an unenviable one with difficult decisions having to be made, whether this is by public governmental bodies or private businesses or institutions. In particular, I would say the impact upon those already working in locations which are set to close as well as the local economies of the areas hosting these facilities should be fully considered and any negative impacts mitigated as much as possible. Now, some might think that on the planned re-siting in Edinburgh, workers in Bathgate and Livingston would not face unreasonable changes to their daily travel plans compared to some relocations across larger regions of the UK. But let us be very careful about such assumptions as there are many implications which are of concern about this matter. Uh, research has already been referred to undertaken by the PCS Union and West Lothian Council. And in economic terms, the changes will result in workers having to spend, I understand, an extra £1,300 getting to and from work. Now that is a substantial amount for 85% of the staff who are earning less than £21,000 per annum. The changes to work-life balance are also matters that should be taken on board. Reference has already been made to the 40% of employees estimated to have caring responsibilities. And I would say from personal experience that I think it was Neil Finlay's estimate of one to one and a half hours travel time in each direction is in my view a fairly conservative estimate with a small c because I think depending where one is coming from where one is going in Edinburgh that could easily be two hours travel time each direction. Now I am pleased that HMRC has committed to one-to-one -to -one management engagement with employees on issues including the physical and financial consequences of moving to Edinburgh and I hope that that represents a firm commitment to providing sufficient help to those who need it. But beyond all of this, another consideration that should be looked at is the impact on the local economy, and I think this has been referred to already. The research I've referred to estimates an annual spend loss in the local area of around £1 million and an estimated £7.5 million loss of local income. In these circumstances, a lack of replacement employment could hamper those businesses that have relied upon being closely located to hundreds of potential customers. I would therefore urge HMRC to rethink the proposal carefully, considering how the proposed move will affect employees, the local economy, whether there are real savings to be gained, and whether it is the right decision to take in this case. Thank you very much. I call Lane Smith to be followed by Alison Johnson. Alison Johnson, you'll be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Smith. Thank you, President Officer, um, and congratulations to Neil Finlay for raising this issue. I think um, one of the most disturbing things about these plans by HMRC to move jobs from Bathgate to Edinburgh and the other job moves has been the lack of engagement with staff and specifically PCS Union over the proposals, and that point was also made by Linda Fabiani about the situation in East Kilbride. 
Even if there are no compulsory redundancies as called for by the union, it still means a loss to the local economy. So this specific move, um, the Bathgate move, would have a major effect on workers with travel to work times and costs greatly increased, as well as the detrimental effect this can have on family life, including with childcare and other caring responsibilities. And as other members have pointed out, many of these staff are low-paid workers who can ill afford the extra costs, which basically translates into a pay cut then, and others with disabilities could lose their jobs um, because it may not be feasible for them to commute. Constituents in my area, Central Region, who work in West Lothian are going to be affected by this move if it goes ahead, and others have been directly affected by changes in Central Region itself, such as the example given by Linda Fabiani from our constituency, the workers at Centre One in East Kilbride, who were made aware that their jobs are going to be lost over the next 10 years to Glasgow and Edinburgh. But actually, there's considerable concern that the timeline for closing down East Kilbride's biggest employer is likely to come sooner than expected. As Neil Finlay cites, the potential knock-on effects um, economically of such centres being lost is considerable, and it also entails a significant psychological stress for people. The knowledge that your own job is going is bad enough, but knowing that good jobs are disappearing in your area breeds a sense of insecurity, not to mention the knock-on effects in things like school places and losses of small businesses in the area. So we must do more to save jobs in these towns and promote areas like this as sites of industry and innovation. We all know that the Central Belt has got an ever-growing number of people who are having to commute to work from one side to the other, but it seems that maybe this fact has been used to somehow justify draining away jobs from places like uh, Bathgate and Cumbernauld and East Kilbride to Edinburgh and Glasgow. And there are many people um, across Scotland concerned that their towns are being gradually run down. So fighting to keep important jobs, such as the ones in Bathgate that we're discussing tonight, is a key step to, towards trying to prevent that happening. And year on year, the average commute for Scottish workers is increasing. And as we know, the costs of that are doing so as well. And that's time spent away from families. It reduces leisure time, it increases stress. And particularly when public transport, as mentioned by Neil Finlay, like our privatised railways, doesn't seem to be working for commuters as it should. The option of driving is unattractive, even for those with cars, due to the congestion on our main motorway connecting Glasgow and Edinburgh. And it's bad anyway for the environment. So I very much support the efforts of the PCS to raise this issue and I hope that we can um, further raise awareness of the movement of jobs around Scotland. It's not just those that leave Scotland altogether. And in many cases, as I've said, the effects in small towns can be disastrous. The, the Bathgate and Edinburgh sites should both continue, but just as East Kilbride um, and Glasgow should also continue and all the other smaller sites. And I think that would be part of a sustainable strategy for urban regeneration, rather than concentrating prosperity in distinct city pockets. Now, just uh, to come to a conclusion, we're told there's no alternative to the austerity agenda, but the failure to close, uh, there's a failure to close a tax gap that loses the UK economy about £120 billion a year. And at the same time, jobs in pay are being cut, benefits are being slashed and public services are being closed. And we know that small businesses are struggling to survive on their high streets and they'll be affected by these closures of local tax offices, while, of course, the multinationals seem to get away with paying little or no tax. Paying tax presiding officer is a good thing for society and those who collect it should be valued. It pays for their public services. So delivering a fair tax system not only means closing the tax gap and making those most able to pay their fair share of taxes pay, but it also means more staff in HMRC, not less. Closing local offices will do nothing for tax justice. So once again, can I congratulate Neil Finlay on bringing this issue to the Chamber. Thank you very much. Call Alison Johnson, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank Neil Finlay for giving us the opportunity to debate this important issue in the Chamber this evening. I realise that this will have an impact, these proposals potentially can impact on people across Scotland, but in the minutes I have, um, I'm going to focus on the impact of these proposals on my constituents in Lothian. Um, I too would like to thank PCS Union, the Council in West Lothian, those employees who have contacted me, and all those who are working hard to ensure that these jobs remain in Bathgate. If staff have to move to Edinburgh, there will be many negative impacts, including increased travel costs. Now, if we're looking at an average of £1,300 a year in travel cost out of a salary of £21,000 a year, that is a cut of effectively 8%. You know, those are not the kind of cuts we could possibly support on a salary that is not exactly huge in the first instance. And this is incredibly important work, as colleagues have stated. 
You know, if we're not collecting tax efficiently, then public services are hit even more than they currently are. I was looking earlier at the, the travel implications, and you may be interested to know that earlier this year, the journey between the west of Edinburgh, Maybury Road to Princess Street, was considered to be the most congested road in the UK outside London. And apparently, if you travel out on a regular basis, you will spend <laughs> 43 hours a year in gridlock. This is not a journey that anyone would choose to undertake lightly. I think it's really important to understand as well that, that there is a community of people in Bathgate. They live together, they work together, their children are at school together, they use the local shops and the local businesses, and many of these will be impacted massively if they don't have colleagues who are in regular, meaningful, you know, properly paid, well-recognised employment. I think it's essential that we get away from an idea that we have to centralise business in Edinburgh and Glasgow. I mean, in my opinion, far too many people are having to travel from where they live to come into this very city to work. You only have to try and get about the roads in Edinburgh um, in the morning. You know, I've had the, the privilege of living here for 50 years, but increasingly gridlock is becoming an issue. We already have several air pollution hotspots that are breaking EU limits. It's time we address this and asking people to travel from West Lothian into the city centre simply makes no sense whatsoever. So I think this, this euphemism of consolidation, I mean, really it's unnecessary centralisation and I think it's just disguising cuts. I was really pleased to, to sign with colleagues the statement urging HMRC and the UK government to look again at these proposals. I mean, I really have a feeling that they have been designed by someone who just doesn't understand the impact, the losses that this will have. The stress that this is putting on people at the moment is immense. I'm pleased to support calls to pause this procurement process now. And I also support calls for proper public and parliamentary scrutiny. I think the fact that there is cross-party support um, for this agenda it means that we should carry on working together to do all that we can and be interested to hear what the minister has to say regarding any discussions that that are ongoing with HMRC with the UK government um, finally presiding officer I think we have to look to at the business case for this it seems to me that flawed would be one way to to, to look at it it's costing the taxpayer a fortune and I'm really concerned that if we lose these skilled expert employees, we will face even greater cuts than we have at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call on Paul Wheelhouse to close for the government. Minister, seven minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And uh, I would like to thank uh, also Neil Finlay for uh, raising today's motion. It's been a high quality of debate we've had today and clearly a, a very strong example of cross-party consensus in, in this chamber, which I think is, is very welcome. Uh, I, I appreciate and acknowledge that members have raised genuine and heartfelt concerns around HMRC and the impact of the Building Our Future Transformation programme, as it's thus dubbed. Uh, indeed, I met yesterday with Angela Constance and PCS representatives from the Bathgate site, and I know that Fiona Hislop, my colleague, has been very active on the case as well. I take on board the point that uh, Linda Fabiani and indeed uh, Elaine Smith and others have also uh, made points about previous campaigns, and I very much welcome Miles Briggs' uh, uh, bipartisan action in writing to uh, UK Minister and indeed uh, HMRC on this issue. So we clearly have a consensus around the Chamber. But this 10-year uh, HMRC programme, as it currently stands, will see the creation of two regional centres in Glasgow and Edinburgh, as members have said, and the gradual closure of many smaller HMRC offices across Scotland and indeed, as was made a uh, point made by uh, Neil Finlay, uh, across the rest of the UK. And with the, um, if, briefly, if I may. Mr Finlay. He said he had met uh, PCS uh, members yesterday. Can I ask if he's met the senior officials of PCS Scotland on this issue recently and what was the outcome of that? Mr Villiers. I've, I've not as yet. I, I've merely uh, met at the request of Angela Constance, local representative from Bathgate, and I'm sure that's an area that Mr Finlay has an interest in as well to, to understand. But I will uh, look to see if I can engage with UK ministers. But I'm going to refer to how other ministers uh, in the government have tried to engage on the issue, which may help Mr Finlay. With the impending closure of HMRC offices in West Lothian, concerns have been raised again today about the impact of office closures on our communities, on jobs, on the local economy and businesses of West Lothian, 
and indeed further afield across Scotland, but most importantly on the lives of those workers having to relocate. And that came across very strongly in a meeting I had yesterday with PCS uh, around the impact on individuals. And we've heard from a number of members about the 40% of, of employees at Bathgate alone who have caring responsibilities. And it's clearly not tenable to suggest that changes of this magnitude in terms of the work-life pattern will have no impact on their ability to care for those they have responsibility for. So it's a very important point. But this debate today demonstrates that this parliament cares about people uh, and it's appropriate that as a parliament we take notice and respond to these issues when they arise. I'm therefore grateful, as I say, to Neil Finlay for bringing this to the attention of the Scottish Parliament to all who have taken part in the debate this afternoon. Indeed, those who have written to me who are not able to take part in today's debate. Um, I will come back to uh, specific points uh, more thoroughly, but I'll pick up a few just mo at the moment, if I may. Uh, certainly, Neil Finlay, I think, uh, made a very powerful contribution early on around uh, the issues that are covered here. Certainly, the, uh, the point that some individuals have faced a third redundancy, potentially, is not an insignificant one from people's mental health. The, the stress of that would be enormous on those individuals. Uh, the impact on the local economy, £1 million directly in terms of the spending power in the local shops, but clearly having a multiplier effect through the wider economy. And uh, we do have a, a concern about that, clearly. Uh, the fact that, uh, as Alison Johnson has said, and Linda Fabiani and others, that the, these are affecting the, the communities in places like Bathgate, where people are all working together. So it will have a contagious effect throughout the community, potentially several uh, uh, you know, large, large, large uh, groups of people being affected simultaneously. Um, the cost of travel, clearly, a number of members have raised this point, but the cost of travel to Edinburgh, and of course, further a fuel for other sites that are being closed down, is an enormous issue to take on board and uh, potentially even if compensation was given that compensation may be taxed uh, so it's not necessarily going to have the full effect uh, we heard this from PCS yesterday that even as an allowance given to staff to cover the cost of transport from Bathgate to Edinburgh that itself may be subject to income tax so uh, they may not actually get a full compensation for the cost they face uh, and in fact that the vast majority I think Miles Briggs referred to 85 percent of staff having under 21,000 pounds annually salary uh, is clearly a, a not inconsiderable factor. Um, I'll come back to other members later, but I just want to make some progress. But as, as we've acknowledged together in this debate, this decision taken by the UK government will affect many in local communities, not least uh, staff employed in these offices, people who often for many years have provided a valuable uh, and valued accessible service. And indeed, it's that knowledge, that tacit knowledge that potentially you lose if people, maybe not through compulsory redundancies per se, but maybe forced, as a number of members, Aline Smith has said this, maybe forced to, to, to give up their job because simply it's not a feasible option for them to, to transfer to, to Edinburgh or to Glasgow. Um, but it's uh, clearly a, a concern we have. But setting out the clear vision of this Scottish Government to drive sustainable um, uh, economic growth and support investment is one of the priorities within our programme for government. And we want to support jobs and growing Scotland's future. So, of course, HMRC is a Whitehall department and decision making on these matters is reserved to UK government. We understand that. It is clear, however, this programme will close most HMRC offices and make substantial staffing reductions across the UK as a whole. Now, I fully understand that this must be a worrying time for the 8,000 HMRC employees based in Scotland and for the communities where these services have been based. I believe it's crucial we continue to have an open and robust dialogue with Whitehall on this issue and we will continue to challenge and propose workable alternatives to help safeguard jobs, local services and alleviate the likely economic impact of this programme here in Scotland. Indeed, the First Minister has publicly stated her concerns these uh, office closures appear to be putting significant numbers of jobs in Scotland at risk. Um, to address the point that was made by Jackie Bailey, if I may just further expand the point, because I want to address the point Jackie Bailey made. When HMRC announced the next stage of their building our future transformation programme, the First Minister personally spoke to the second Permanent Secretary at HMRC to, really, uh, to relay her uh, grave concerns over job losses. Uh, and Chris Stevens, uh, SN the SNP Member of Parliament for Glasgow South uh, West, led a House of Commons debate on the 28th of April uh, on the HMRC programme. The outcome of that debate concluded that plans should have been subject to parliamentary scrutiny. A number of members have made this point already on a cross-party basis and have called on the UK Government to ensure that our, building our future was suspended until a comprehensive consultation and review is undertaken. Um, uh, I'll bring in uh, Mr Finlay in a minute, but Keith Brown, Scottish Government's um, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, wrote to David Gawke MP, Financial Secretary to HM Treasury, on the 5th of July of this year, uh, to relay the Scottish Government's concerns over the HMRC office closures and to request a meeting to discuss the plan in detail. I regret to say, as far as I'm aware, at this point, we have not had a reply to that letter uh, from Mr Brown. But since the initial announcement, we have remained in constant contact with HMRC itself to remain on top of the situation and to help ensure that our concerns regarding the impact of the programme in Scotland continue to be heard. 
Uh, the wider uh, economic implications of the withdrawal of HMRC from Bathgate have been raised by a number of members today, not least Mr Finlay. Our policy in Scotland is to enhance sustainable economic growth, as I've said, uh, and to support investment in our future. But let me underline some of the targeted support currently being provided uh, to West Lothian by this government. Um, Scottish enterprise support uh, and investment in West Lothian's growth companies and help companies in West Lothian maximise global opportunities. I take on board the point about the pyramids. Uh, business park and if there's work that we can look at specifically to help support employment, alternative employment there, I will look very sympathetically on how we do that. But our work complements the work of Business Gateway in West Lothian uh, and the wider work of local authority in supporting local economic development. And we support the delivery of the West Lothian Economic Growth Plan uh, with £12 million in additional resources alongside existing budgets which represent an overall package of financial support of £26 million. But as I say, um, I stated earlier in response to the request from uh, Angela Constance, local member, I have met with PCS yesterday, I've heard their concerns firsthand, and I've agreed to continue the dialogue with them, which I think would be very important. I'm happy to involve other members in that dialogue, if that would be helpful. Uh, Can't really take an intervention well, at this stage apologize, over time, but Finlay, I think but if happily, you deal with it... I'll happily discuss with Mr Finlay after the, 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 the meeting. Uh, my colleagues also meet regularly with the trade unions and, and Scottish Government officials hold regular meetings on national employment relations uh, issues throughout the strategic, uh, through the strategic forum. Uh, we will certainly keep presiding officer in very close contact with the unions and those affected. We'll continue to work with the UK Government and try and lobby the uh, UK Government to, to, to take an alternative path and I very much welcome the cross-party support for that. But I do acknowledge and, and share members' concerns expressed today about the potential negative impact of these decisions on communities across Scotland. Uh, in my ministry role, I have the opportunity to meet regularly with representatives from, from our communities and the trade unions, and will continue to do so. And I want to leave no room for doubt that we remain fully committed to working with all interested parties at local, national and UK level, including the trade unions, to mitigate the impact of the office closures and job losses in Scotland. HMRC, lastly, is a very valued member of the PACE team uh, that we deploy in response to job losses around Scotland, and I hope they will work with us to demonstrate good practice in how they tackle job losses at a local level. I'm sure we can have a, a good dialogue with them on that. But I want to thank all members here today for taking part in this important debate. Be assured we will continue to work on this issue, and I look forward to hearing from members in due course. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It was a very important subject, so I've let members run slightly over time. Uh, that concludes the debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament. Thank you.